ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ರಂ ಪಶ್ಯೇಮ ಅಕ್ಷಭಿರ್ಯಜತ್ರಂಗೈರ್ತುಷ್ಟುವಾಂಸ್ತನೋಭಿಶೇಮ ದೇವಹಿತೈಯದಾಯು ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ಇಂದ್ರೋ ವೃದ್ರಶ್ರವಾ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ಪೂಷಾ ವಿಶ್ವೇದ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ತಾರ್ಕ್ಷೋ ಅರಿಷ್ಟನೇಮಿ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ಬೃಹಸ್ಪತೀರ್ದೂ ಯೋ ಅಂತ ಪ್ರವಿಶ್ಯ ಮಮವಾಚ ಇಮಾಂ ಪ್ರಶುಪ್ತ ಸಂಜೀವಯತಿ ಅಖಿಲ ಶಕ್ತಿ ದರಸ್ವದಾಂನಾ ಅನ್ಯಾಂಸಹಸ್ತಚರಣ ಶ್ರವಣತ್ವಗಾದೀನ್ ಪುರಾಣ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ಪುರುಷಾಯ ತುಭ್ಯಂ ವಸತು ಶ್ರೀಮದಾನಂದತೀರ್ಥೇಂದುರುಣೋ ಹೃದಂಬರೆ ಯದ್ವಚಂದ್ರಿಕಾ ಸ್ವಾಂತ ಸಂತಾಪಂ ವಿನಿಕೃಂತತಿ ಪದವಾಕ್ಯ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ಜ್ಞಾನ್ ಪ್ರಣಮ್ಯ ಶಿರಸಾ ಗುರೂನ್ ವ್ಯಾಕರಿಷ್ಯೆ ಯಥಾಬೋಧ ವಿಷ್ಣು ತತ್ವಿರ್ಣಯ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಗುಣೈ ಸರ್ವೈರುದೀರ್ಣ ದೋಷವರ್ಜಿತ ಜ್ಞೇಯ ಗಮ್ಯ ಗುರುಂಷ್ಟಾ ನೂತ್ರಾರ್ಥೌಚ್ಯತೆ right good evening everyone so uh, um, welcome to the uh, next series um, so we thought we'll do uh, a, a different topic um, just to uh, remind you all since march as sudarshan mentioned um, last week so this is a fifth month and we have covered quite a bit we have covered quite a bit of syllabus if you like of the the overarching a birds eye view if you like a birds eye view of the sanatana dharma and the various flavors of philosophy that flows in it and we've had a birds eye view uh, just to summarize all that we have done before we looked at some fundamental concepts around creation first we talked about what are the beauties and metaphors of the upanishads then we spent a lot of series talking about what is a soul what is the nature of the soul what is its journey then we jumped into the importance of vedas for hindu dharma sanatana dharma why vedas are central and then we picked up a, a very key um, you know uh, riks from rigveda the purusha sukta and we dwell with it quite exhaustively i would say over eight weeks and we appreciated how uh, you know uh, how philosophically pregnant these uh, riks and vedas are and how one needs to understand it at various depths and levels to grasp the philosophy in it so those are all the things that we have done so we have kind of covered upanishads we have covered a few aspects of vedas we understood what are the views of the souls and creation and so on so now having armed ourselves with this fundamental information some basic informations on sanatana dharma i think we could call ourselves are suitably equipped with the background knowledge to go and try and tackle this what's called as brahma sutra or vedanta sutra in uh, in our in our uh, system so brahma sutra essentially is the science of brahman yeah we've all heard about brahman and uh, who he is what he is you know what are his natures how is he celebrated in the vedas and the upanishads this is the core topic of brahma sutras it is the science of brahman so what we will do today is i hope is over the next 15 minutes i want to keep up to time and give friends uh, adequate time for q and a and over the next 15 minutes i'll give you a, a, an introductory tour of what brahma sutra is and we'll start off with the very first sutra and then we'll see how things go in the subsequent weeks let's say about 8 to 10 weeks let's deal with the first five adhikaranams as we call it of brahma sutra so moving on to the next slide now before we understand what uh, brahma sutra is and where it actually is placed in the hindu system i think it's it's important for us to have some basic understanding of what are all the indian systems of philosophy okay, okay. so what is philosophy philosophy essentially means tatva niranaya tatva nirnaya is philosophy so what is tatva nirnaya tatva nirnaya means determination of things as they are in themselves so that is the the whole definition of philosophy so in the indian civilization over thousands of years our rishis and exalted souls have thought about some deep basic problems of existence and they have come up with various views and philosophical systems all these views and philosophical systems get their inspiration 
from the Vedas. So there are six basic systems of Indian philosophy called uh, Shat Darshanas. So Kapila, so Sankhya, Yoga, Nyaya, Vaiseshika, Purva Mimamsa, Vedanta, which is also called Uttara Mimamsa. So these are the six basic schools of Indian philosophy that try and tackle existential existence. Who are we? Why are we here? What is this existence? Where did the universe come from? Is there a control of the universe? You know, those kind of questions. Now, I have also given you the details of who are all the rishis who have actually brought forth these philosophical systems. So Kapila is Sankhya, Kapila Rishi. Don't confuse him with one of Vishnu's avatar. This is a different person. This is a different Rishi. So Kapila was the founder of the Sankhya system. I won't say founder. He brought forth the Sankhya system. Patanjali, you're all familiar with Pat Patanjali and that's his yoga system. Then you have Nyaya, Vaiseshika, Nyaya from Gautama Rishi, Vaiseshika schools, the Atom theory of universe come from Kannada. Then you have Purva Mimamsa from Jaimini and the Uttara Mimamsa or Vedanta schools of Indian philosophy coming from Veda Vyasa, the Rishi Veda Vyasa. He has lots of other names. He is also called Badarayana. He is also called Krishna Dvaipayana. So those threes are used, uh, you know, uh, uh, synonymous and people interchange the name. So if I say Badarayana in my lecture, I mean Veda Vyasa. So you need to remember these key individuals, these key personalities who have brought forth their various views of the existential questions and they've all gained their inspiration from the Vedas. So because they gain their inspirations from the Vedas, they're called Astika school of philosophy or the orthodox schools of philosophy within the Indian system. Then you have the heterodox or the Nastika schools. So the Nastika schools are the ones that have shunned the Vedic, uh, the Vedic text and the Vedic body of literature. And they have, although they have shunned, uh, it is very true to say that they've actually extracted many of the views and systems within our, within the Astika schools and, it, and they have extracted and absorbed them in their own schools. So you have the Charvaka Darshana, which is the materialist, that is all of us. Then you have the Jainism and the Buddhist. So they belong to the Nastika schools. And then you have the Astika schools, which six flavors of view of things. And we are focusing on the Vedanta Darshana as brought forward by Veda Vyasa, Badarayana, or Krishna Dvaipayana. Now, the other five schools, the, the portions of this still exist in India and other parts of the world. There are still experts of Sankhya and Yoga. You might find them in various universities, in various faculties. The people are experts in these philosophy, Nyaya, Tarka, Purva Mimamsa. So these are all still exist. But the Vedanta system has actually taken over the Bharat Varsha by and large. So what we have at this point of time over the last 2000 years or so, it is a Vedantic system of philosophy that has flourished and blossomed in the Indian civilization. So moving on to the next slide. So um, Veda Vyasa, the, um, the, the chap who has actually brought forth the Vedantic system of philosophy is no ordinary person. So his whole uh, achievements and his whole contribution to, to, um, to our understanding of the nature of the universe and everything else that exists in this has been very nicely summarized in Skanda Purana. And we have dealt with this on several occasions. But I'm never tired of quoting and citing this because this whole sequence of verses from Skanda Purana is so beautiful. So it goes like this. Narayana dvinishpannam jnanam krutayuge stitam kinchitta anyata jatam tretayam dvapare akilam gautamasya rishehe shapa jnane tu ajnana tam gatehe sankirta buddhayo devaha brahma rudra purasaraha sharanyam sharanam jagmuhu narayanam anamayam tair vidna pitakadiasthu bhagavan purushottamaha avatirno Mahayogi, Satyavatyam, Parasharat, Utsannan, Bhagavan, Veda, Unjahara, Harihi, Swayam, Chaturda, Vyabhachatu, Tamsha, Chatur, Vimshatida, Punaha, Shatada, cha Ekada, Chaiva, Tata, cha Sahasrada, Krishno, Dvadashada, Chaiva, Punastasyarta, Vidtaye. So, this beautiful summary from Skanda Purana says, so What is the nature of the Indian civilization? Just at the end of the Dwapara Vega, where much of the knowledge was lost. So, Brahma, Rudra, and other devatas. They went to Narayana and said, look, the civilization is degrading. Do something about it. 
So at that point of time, Veda Vyasa takes an incarnation. He appears on, on Bharat Varsha, uh, Satyavati and Parashara are his parents and he comes out and then he says, you know, these guys have lost a lot of Vedas. There is no hope for actually retrieving ones that have been lost. Let me conserve what is still present on the land. So what he did was he collected all the Vedas that were there and he gave it to his four students. So on the right side, I've summarized that. He gave the whatever Veda that was available, he gave it to four students. Paila, he gave him that portion that was called as Rig Veda. Vaishampayana, he gave that portion we now call as Yajur Veda. Jaimini, that portion we call as Sama Veda. And Sumantu. Now these rishis then spread that portion of the Vedas to his disciples, to their disciples. And that's how the families expanded and flourished in Bharat Varsha. So, Shake is four Shakes, Rig, Yajur, Sama, Atharva. Upashakas are the other branches that come down. And Rig, there are 24. Yajur, there are two branches, as you know. Krishna, Yajur Veda, Shukla, Yajur Veda. One by Vaishampayana, the other one from Yagnyavalkya. And they had their own family, uh, the disciples and families who were preserving it, 86 and 15. Sama had 1,000, Atharva had 12. So that was the state at that time when Veda Vyasa uh, was doing this. Now, of course, over the last 2,000, 3,000 years, we've lost, we've lost most of it. So currently, if you take Vedic literature as such, there are about 20,000 verses that are still available to us. So one of the greatest contributions of Veda Vyasa is he is a compiler of the Vedas. And even in Gita, just to do it, then verse 37, Krishna says, Muni nam aham vyasaha. So he makes it clear. In, so these are all the evidence, one from Skanda Purana and from, from Gita, to clearly give us the information that Narayana himself incarnated on, on Bharat Varsha as Veda Vyasa. Okay? Now he, Krishna says, I am Veda Vyasa. Yeah? So Veda Vyasa was not an ordinary Rishi. He was the incarnation of Vishnu himself. So that is our that is a big piece of information that we have to retain in our brains. If this is what this was any Tom, Dick, and Harry rishis, or they, uh, uh, the whole Sanatana Dharma would not be basing entirely on all the things that Veda Vyasa has done. He is beyond a rishi. He is incarnation of Vishnu himself. So moving on to the next slide. So what Veda Vyasa did was he compiled all the, um, the Vedas. Then he said, okay, these guys, you compile all the Vedas, but still these chaps should have some kind of a rule, some kind of a dictionary, some kind of manual to try and understand the Vedas. So he composed Vedanta Sutra for the lost souls like us who can understand the Vedas through the manual called the Vedanta Sutra. So Veda Vyasa is the composer of the Vedanta Sutra. Vedanta Sutra also has got various names. Uh, Brahma Sutra, the title for our series. It is also called Brahma Mimamsa to differentiate it from Purva Mimamsa of Jaimini. And it is also called Shari Raka Sutra. So that is interesting. Shari Raka Sutra. Why is it called Shari Raka Sutra? Let's think about it. Sharira means, Sharira means this body. Okay? So inside the Sharira is called Shariri. The one that is inside the body is called Shariri. It is the Jiva. Now, who is inside the Jiva is called Shari Raka. Okay? Who is inside the Jiva? It is the Paramatman himself. So, it is the investigation of the study of that Paramatma who is inside Jiva. And that is why it is called Shari Raka Sutra. So, the Skanda Purana goes on. So, the next paragraph of the Skanda Purana basically says, Chakara Brahma Sutrani Yesham Sutratvam Anjasa. Alpaksharam, Asandiktam, Saravat, Vishwato Mukam, Astobhyam, Anavadhyam, Cha Sutram, Sutra Vido, Vidu. Nirvisheshata Sutratvam, Brahma Sutrasya Chapyataha, Yata Vyasatvam, Yekasya Krishna, Anye Visheshana. Saviseshana Sutrani, Aparani Veda Vido, Viruhu. Mukhyasya Nirvisheshana Shabdo, Anyesham Visheshataha. Iti. Veda Vidaha Prahuhu Shabda Tatvartha Vadinaha Sutre Shuesh Sarve Api Nirnayaha Samudhi Ritaha Shabda Jatasya Sarvasya Yet Pramanashta Nirnayaha. So these are beautiful, profound statements from Skanda Purana. Let me take at least a couple of words and explain it to you. And I put them in boxes. 
அல்பாக்ஷரம் அசந்திக்தம் சாரவத் விஸ்வதோ முகம் அஸ்தோபியம் மனவத்தியம் ச சூத்திரம் சூத்திர விதோ விதுகு சந்த புராணா கிவ்ஸ் அ டெபினிஷன் ஆஃப் வாட் பிரம்ம சூத்ரா மீன்ஸ் வாட் இஸ் அ சூத்ரா தேர் ஆர் சிக்ஸ் கிரைடீரியாஸ் ஃபார் அ சூத்ரா அல்பாக்ஷரம் இட் ஹேஸ் few words the bare number of words that is required asandiktam it is free from doubts saravat it is full of philosophical meanings vishvato mukam that means it has wide applicability not just in one portion of the vedas or the upanishads or the gita or the puranas every agama or shastra when you want to understand you should apply the rules of the brahma sutra to understand it so that is called saravat vishme that is called vishvato mukam widely uh, it's what wide meaning astobyam no unnecessary details no beating around the bush to the point that is sutra anavadyam and it is free of flaws so these six characteristics or characteristic features of brahma sutra and the skanda purana says if i say sutra it means brahma sutra yeah there are other sutras jaimini sutra devi mimamsa sutra you know there are so many sutras that are available but when somebody says sutra it means it's brahma sutra just like when somebody says gita it means bhagavad gita you are all familiar with other types of gita like uddhava gita and so on but when i say gita i mean bhagavad gita similarly when i say sutra it is brahma sutra now brahma sutra have got the high pedestal uh, view of what is called they are called nirnayaka shastra nirnayaka shastra means they determine what a particular shastra actually means so nirnay there are two things here one is called nirnayaka shastra the other one is called nirneya shastra nirneya shastra means that body of text that we need to interpret and nirnayaka shastra means that manual that you use to interpret the shastra so brahma sutras are called nirnayaka shastra in fact we would actually uh, the, the 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 all groups of uh, you know um, the dvaita the uh, dvaita visishta dvaita and advaita schools that we have we all consider brahma sutra as the supreme court of vedic philosophy that is the last word for the understanding of certain philosophies in the vedas the brahma sutra says this that is it that is the supreme court verdict there is no refuting or going against this there is no appeals uh, in this situation it is a final say in vedic philosophy now even in gita again uh, you should search this and in 15 and in 13 krishna talks so much about this so in 15 he says vedanta krit vedavi deve cha aham so we have dealt with this uh, on several occasions and he says vedanta krit i have written the vedanta sutra vedanta means vedanta sutra sutra means vedanta sutra yeah and in chapter 13 he says brahma sutra padashchaiva hetum abdir vinishchitah vinishchitaihi hetum abdir vinishchitaihi so what he says is the learned and the philosophers use brahma sutra padas that is the sutras of brahma sutra to determine what is the truth within the shastras so krishna has made it categorically clear to all of us that if we need to understand even the gita itself we need to use the tools of brahma sutra to understand what the gita is saying okay such is the exalted position of brahma sutras so moving on to the next stage next slide so brahma sutra because it holds such high pedestal in 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 vedantic philosophy brahma sutra itself is called paravidya yeah. now we have dealt with this concept of paravidya on several occasions over the last four or five months let me take through this beautiful verses in atharvana upanishad or mundaka upanishad shaunako havai mahashalaha angirasam vidivat upasannah prapracha kasmin bhagavo vignate sarvam idam vignatam bhavati iti so shavunoka goes to angirasa and says what is it that i need to know knowing which means that i know everything so um, uh, angirasa is saying dve vidye veditavye iti hasmayate brahma vido vadanti paracha aparacha tatra apara rigvedo yajurvedah samavedo atarvana vedah siksha kalpo vyakaranam niruk chando jyotisham iti at para yaya tat aksharam adigamyate so he says all these vedas and the veda angas all become aparavidya or lower knowledge 
when you see only the superficial sense of it. But when you take the philosophical sense using this apparatus called the Brahma Sutras, and when this Vedic body of uh, literature tells you about that aksharam, ata para yaya tad aksharam adhigamyate, that which tells you about the para, that which tells you about the Paramatman, that which tells you about Vishnu, Narayana, that is that when it tells that, then it becomes Paravidya. So the whole body of Brahma Sutra is Paravidya because it talks about the science of Brahman. It talks about the science of Vishnu, Narayana or whatever you want to call it. So Madhvacharya, for example, in Anuvyakhyana, which is a, which is a very important text, he says, Paravidyakyam Chakre Shastram Anuttamam. He says, this is the highest body of philosophical text. This is the highest scripture that you can have. There is nothing that can be compared to it and there is nothing that is beyond it. Such is the importance that is given to Brahma Sutras or Vedanta Sutras in various philosophical schools. Now, the next question that will come to us is, it all feels very sentimental of saying, oh, this is very important text. Why is Brahma Sutra most authoritative? And I put that on the right side of this slide. Why is it most authoritative? How do I convince you all that Brahma Sutra, the Vedanta Sutra, is the spine in which everything else stands? Okay? So in Anubhyakhyana, Acharya goes on and says, Vaktru Shrotru Prasaktinam Yad Aptir Anukulata Apta Vakyataya Chena Shuti Mulataya Tata Yukti Mulataya Chaiva Pramanyam Trividam Mahat Drushyate Brahma Sutranam Yekada Anyatra Sarvasha Ato Naita Drusham Kinchit Pramanatamam Yishyate. Beautiful words there. Basically saying, for any body of, um, you know, for any, any discussion, any philosophical discussion to happen, number, there are two, th two things that needs to be satisfied. The first one is Vaktra, Shrotra, Prasakti. Prasakti means Prasanga. Prasanga means the situation. Shrotru means the ones who hear. So they are the students. And Vaktru means the one who says. So that is the teacher. So the teacher, the student, and the topic for discussion has to be perfect. It has to be really relevant. So what do we have here? The, who are the students here? Brahma, Rudra, the Devatas are the students. They have gone to Vishnu himself saying, this, please teach us all this. Something, something has gone wrong here. So Brahma, Rudra, these are the students. These are the, the, the greatest and the highest Devatas that we worship in our Vedic system. Then who is the teacher? The teacher is Vedavyasa, who is Vishnu himself, who is the Sarvajna, who is omniscient. He is the teacher. And what is the situation? This is a very difficult situation of preserving the Vedas and its philosophy and it becomes so relevant. So those three have actually aligned extremely well in the situation. So it becomes a, a very authentic body of text. Next point. Now, how do we know what is being discussed in this situation between the teacher and student is actually the most appropriate? So for any such body of text, three things needs to be satisfied. Apta Vakyataya, which means somebody who is most eligible to say that. Apta Vakya. Apta Vakya means what he says is the truth. Apta Vakyataya. Now, who else can be more Apta than Vishnu or Narayana or God himself who is Sarvajna? Next point. Shruti Mulataya. Shruti means Vedas. That which is based on Vedas and the teachings of the Vedas. Why are Vedas the highest body of literature? We have discussed that before. We devoted one session talking about Aporushayatva of Veda and how why Vedas are the supreme source of literature for us. So it needs to have, it needs to grasp that from Shruti Mulataya. It should be based on the Vedas. And the next one is interesting. Yukti Mulataya. Yukti means logic, reasoning, sensible discussion, logical discussion. So we don't want some some uh, you know, sentimental rubbish to be discussed here. We need, as rational human beings, we want things to be logical, deductive, and go through a sequence so that we can understand what the problem and what the solution is. So these are the three things that, that usually are cited to describe any text as very authentic. So some texts can just have opta, 
some uh, Vedas are based only on Vedas, and some texts can be based only on Yukti. So even if one of the three is cracked, is satisfied, you would say that this text is very authentic. But look at Brahma Sutra, all three of them are satisfied. And that's why Acharya says this is the supreme text. It is one of the greatest texts that we as human beings, we have 100 years or so left in our life. We have already wasted 30, 40, 50 years of our life. So whatever that is left over the next 20, 30 or 40 years, we should make use of these texts that are available at our disposal and learn fundamental truths. So Brahma Sutra is the manual for the interpretation of the Vedas, Gita, Puranas, etc. Okay, All the Sadagamas, you can understand and the right sense only if you apply Brahma Sutra. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. So what I have said so far is not surprising because the Vedantic philosophy that we have come down from us from Badarayana or Veda Vyasa and then subsequently taken on by the, the three giants of Vedantic system have all adopted what is called as Prasthana Trai. Okay? They have taken the material from three key scriptures to elaborate and spread their philosophy about the view on existential matters. So it's called Brahma Sutra Prasthana. Upanishad Prasthana and Gita Prasthana. So these are the three pillars. And using these three pillars, Shankaracharya has come with his Advaita school of philosophy, Ramanujacharya with Vishishta Advaita school of philosophy, and Matvacharya from Dvaita school of philosophy. I have just named these three, but there are other traits of a mixture, a combination of Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva. There is a combination of these philosophies and other systems have also evolved in Bharat Russia over the last thousand, two thousand years. Okay. So Prasthana Trayi is foundational and Brahma Sutra is very important there because the interpretation of the Upanishads and Gita, Brahma Sutra is used for that. So in that sense, although the three are pillars, the first one probably is the most important among the three pillars. So moving on to the next <coughs> slide. So now, because the Brahma Sutra is so important and uh, all the Acharyas who come down and we discussed this in our Guru Purnima day, we are indeed fortunate for having been born as Indians and for being having that ancestral heritage because that is a sacred land indeed because that piece of land over thousands of years has seen the appearance of the greatest philosophers that have ever existed on earth. Yeah. And all these great philosophers who ever existed on earth in Bharat Varsha have done commentaries on the Brahma Sutras because historically it has been the most important text that has to be used for philosophical speculation. So look at this here, right in the middle. I've given you Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva. So Shankara's commentary, Brahma Sutra Bhashya, is the 20th in the line. Ramanuja's commentary called Sri Bhashya is the 21st commentary. Then Madhva Acharya's commentary called Brahma Sutra Bhashya is the 22nd. Yeah. Now before, on the left I have listed some 20 or so previous commentators on the Brahma Sutra. And following Madhva's commentary, you have seven other great philosophers who have also done commentaries on the Brahma Sutra. Some of the names would be very familiar to you. Nimbarka, Vallabha, Baladeva, Vidya Bhushana. And on the left, you can see Vritikara, Brahma Datta, Yadava Prakasha. So these are all really big giants of philosophy. So if you ever happen to catch hold of books that describe history of Indian philosophies, these are highly celebrated philosophers in the Indian system. So look at this. There have been 29 commentaries on the Brahma Sutra. And that gives you an idea as to how important Brahma Sutra is in our system. Now, here is a, a, a little bit of a, an interesting um, a bit here. And I don't think this is coincidence. Look at Shankaracharya's commentary. It is the 20th. Look at Ramanujacharya's commentary. It is the 21st. And look at Madhvacharya's commentary. It is 22nd in the line. Now, who is going to tell me what is the significance of 20, 21, and 22? 
Any, any takers, please, whilst I sip a few uh, uh, glass of water, please. So what is the significance of 2021 and 22? Any volunteers? Okay, no. Right, let me just tell you. Is it, is it about uh, Dwaita, Visita Dwaita and uh, thing, something like that? Yeah, explain. Ex uh, Sudarshan, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, Advaita is about uh, both are the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, Advaita is, you know, both are both are different, you know. And uh, yeah. I don't know, I mean, uh, the Visita Advaita is a bit, you know, the, the, it is it is similar as well as it is separate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sudarshan. I think you 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 uh, you are you are right. So just to expand on what Sudarshan had said, so twenty. So two always means Jiva and Brahma. Okay. So Jiva and Brahma in Advaita philosophy are one, but their nature is zero. They are Nirguna or Shunya. It's called Shunya Vada. Okay. Uh, so Maya Vada is essentially Shunya Vada, Nirguna Brahma Vada. Nirguna means uh, an entity which has got no attribute. So it's as equivalent to zero. Okay. So two, Jiva and Brahma is two, but the nature is Nirguna. So that is the uh, significance of zero. Look at Vishishta Advaita. Jiva and Brahma, Jiva and Brahma are there, they are different, but their experience of bliss in moksha is the same. That is a key view of Vishishta Advaita. That the, the quality and the quantity of eternal bliss that the Jiva experiences in moksha is the same as Brahman. So it is one. They are different, but their experience of uh, bliss is same. So that is two one. And two two is Jiva and Brahma are different and their experience of bliss in the moksha, although it is bliss, the intensity and the quantity of it is different. Okay. So these are uh, higher levels of philosophy that hopefully we'll deal with as we go along. But 20 and 21 and 22, if you look at it, this is not uh, a coincidence. It is just, it is there for us to understand what is the essence of the philosophy of the respectful Acharyas who have provided the commentary. And I hope that's, that's interesting. So moving on to the next slide. So now we have understood that there are 29 commentaries of the Brahma Sutra. Now let's go to the nitty gritties of it. So what is the overall scheme of the Brahma Sutra? We all know that Bhagavad Gita has 700 verses. Everybody is familiar with that. And some of Brahma Sutras have, are not very popular because they are cryptic and they are quite, quite enigmatic, esoteric, whatever term you want to use kind of text. But I want to give you some uh, overall, uh, overall scheme of the sutras. So like all bodies of text, it has got chapters. Chapters are called Adhyayas. So there are four Adhyayas of Brahma Sutra. The first one is called Samanvaya Adhyaya. Second one is called Avirodha Adhyaya. Third one is called Sadhana Adhyaya. And the fourth one is called Phala Adhyaya. So this is very nice. The way in which Veda Vyasa has set it. Samanvaya Adhyaya means the manual actually gives you some rules of interpretation of the Vedas, Upanishads, Gitas, etc. So that you can do Samanvaya. Samanvaya means that they are all saying the same thing, that they are all talking about Brahman or the Supreme Being. How do you reconcile the different views of the Upanishads and Vedas, but understand the Samanvaya? That is, they are talking the same thing. So that is the Samanvaya Adhyaya. Avirodha Adhyaya is beautiful. It is, it is a really intellectual chapter. It talks about various other schools of philosophy and why those schools of philosophies are flawed. And Badarayana establishes the Vedantic philosophy as the right one. Okay. Sadhana Adhyaya means what is it that the souls have to do to progress in their life so that they can attain moksha. Pala Adhyaya means Pala is moksha. What are the roots to moksha? How do the souls go? Where do they sit when they left this body? What happens to them? And how do they go to Brahma Loka? And when they achieve moksha, what happens to them and all that? So if you're really interested in this kind of matters, then you should go to Pala Adhyaya and then explore this. So these are the four chapters. Now each chapter is divided into four padas, subsections. So each chapter has four sections. So four chapters with four subsections makes it 16 subsections of padas. So there are 16 padas. Now in each pada or subsections, there is something called adhikaranas. Adhikaranas means philosophical topic for discussion. 
okay so first adhikaranam is called jignasya adhikaranam which means is there any sense in making a, an investigation into the existence or the non existence of brahman is the question how do you go and uh, evaluate that which is a commonest question that we face in modern times so it is a philosophical topic is called adhikarana and in that philosophical topic you may have one sutra you may have lots of sutras yeah so that is the overall uh, organization of this text so you have 16 padas you have 222 adhikaranas then you have 564 sutras okay now when you see this arrangement and as you know these are all not random arrangements they all have some sense they all have you know they are they are, they are telling us something these numerology these numbers veda vyasa is a, is, a, is a, let's not forget he is he is, he is the omniscient being himself and when he says 16 you have to ask the question why is veda vyasa take a made only 16 padas not 15 padas or 17 padas why there are only 222 adhikaranas why there are only 564 sutras you could have made 700 sutras like gita so you have when you ask these questions you get interesting answers and and some of you will know that answer already so when i say 16 and we have done it so many times 16 means the shodasha kala purusha the 16 the one the purusha who is in all the 16 is the is the purusha of the purusha shukta so it celebrates the supreme 2 2 and 2 so two there means it is talking about jiva and brahma jivan and brahman is what it is talking about now look at 564 why 564 sutras this is interesting if you place the sanskrit alphabet so so you have the vowels and you have the consonants and if you look at where is 5 where is 6 and where is 4 so the number 5 will correspond to na number 6 corresponds to sh a number 4 corresponds to va so there is a rule called anka nam vamato gatihi so you do reverse counting from your little finger so when you do that anka nam vamato gatihi it becomes varsha na vishnu so even the arrangement of the sutra tells you that it is talking about vishnu look at gita just to give you a hint 574 verses are the verses that krishna spoke to arjuna to add all these numbers it becomes 16 and 16 is what celebration of the shodasha kala purusha so all these numbers that the that badarayana vedavyasa puts in there's so much philosophy in it and and one cannot stop by wondering with regards to the way in which this has been composed so moving on to the next slide so now we have an understanding of the um, of the various uh, this overall scheme of the sutras and now we have to go and understand how the sutra talks about so it's a very rational approach for those who are interested in this this is very a uh, rational approach and then on the right side i have put cold learning cycle many of you who go through various adult courses and so on it will talk to you about cold learning cycle how does a learning cycle in adults come about you have a abstract concept you do active experimentation you get some results you have a concrete experience then based on that you reflect on something and then it goes around in circles and you increase your learning that is exactly a principle that is adopted in the teachings of the brahma sutra so this is called vada katha which is philosophical disputation so the way it starts is there are there are five uh, con, uh, five areas vishaya means the subject of discussion then you have on the right uh, is called vishaya that is the doubt then you have the objectus view called purva paksha purva paksha is the objectus view and then siddhanta is that you refute the objectus view and come up with a, 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 a siddhanta or a conclusion and that conclusion has a priyojana okay my arrows has to be reversed i'll change it in my slide somehow i i flipped the my arrows but it needs to be the other way around so you have vishaya visaya purva praksha siddhanta and priyojana so these are kind of you know debate kind of disputation kind, it's argumentative text of going back and forth no you are wrong no i am right that kind of approach so that's called vada katha and that's how you establish philosophies all philosophies are based on disputations yeah constructive disputations you don't take a knife and kill people because somebody don't accept or agree with you but this is knowledge exchange of ideas going on to the next slide so the whole of brahma sutra then talks about these fundamental principles that you are all know about so there are only three things in existence brahman jiva and jada i'm finally happy my my parrots are back on the stage and they are on the slides now so i have put these parrots from mundaka upanishad you know the famous dwasaparana you have brahman you have jiva and you have the prakriti 
So Brahman, Jiva and Jada. Jada is uh, Prakriti. Now there are only three means of knowing knowledge about these three. There are only three ways. Pratyaksha, Anumana and Agama. Pratyaksha is perception. Anumana is logical reasoning. Agama is scriptural revelation. So you have three and three. So three existential entities and three means of knowing them. Now if you look at Jada, we all see the Jada, the material world, through our sense organs. So we don't need any uh, philosophical or scriptural text to try and explore Jadas. We don't. Jivas, to some extent, we all know that we exist. I may not know to full extent what my nature is, what is the nature of me as a Jiva. I will know only the supreme desires to remove that ignorance. But to some extent, I know I exist. So the discussions on Jiva and Jada in some extent can be achieved through Pratyaksha and Anumana. Whereas the science of Brahman, of knowing God, we cannot do that by pure reasoning or logic or through sense perception because we all know that this guy is beyond. He's super, uh, he's super sensual, sensory. So for understanding that Brahman, then we have to go to the scriptures, which is the Brahma Mimamsa Shastra. So moving on to the next slide. So now, as I said, there are 564 sutras and there are 222 adhikaranams. Each adhikaranam is a philosophical topic or shastra vichara as we call it for discussion so that we as rational beings can understand and progress in our life. Now, 222 adhikaranams sounds like a lot of adhikaranams to cover over 10 week, 8 to 10 weeks. So what I thought I'll do is give you the, the basic foundations. That is the first five Adhikaranams. They are called Jig, uh, Jignasya Adhikaranam, Janmadhyaya Adhikaranam, Shastra Yonitva Adhikaranam, Samanvaya Adhikaranam, Ikshatya Adhikaranam. So these are the five Adhikaranams. The first five Adhikaranams, which is the introductory part. So these are basic, these are foundational Adhikaranams before you explore and expand the other parts of the Brahma Sutra. So my hope here is that I'll focus on these five Adhikaranams over the next eight to ten weeks. Each Adhikaranam or Sutras we can take uh, two weeks each and then explore this. Okay. So we dive straight into our first Sutra then. Next slide Abhijit. So now we dive directly into Ataha Pratamodhyayaha Jignasa Adhikaranam Om Atato Brahma Jignasa Om. This is the very first sutra, the most famous sutra of Badarayana, where he says, Om Atato Brahma Jignasa Om. So one of the traditions in some schools is to compact, to kind of protect the sutras between Om in the beginning and Om at the end. It's, it's, it's a kind of protecting the sutra so that it is auspicious and it's almost a Mangala Charana. Okay? Om Atato Brahma Jignasa Om. Some schools don't follow this tradition. They just go as Atato Brahma Jignasa Om. That is not um, for our discussion, but we are focused on the key concept of Atato Brahma Jignasa Om, which is the first sutra. What is Badarayana, Veda Vyasa, is actually telling us in this sutra? Let's go to the next slide. So, we need not to forget that as I said, the approach to the sutras of Badarayana is very lively. It is not dry, empirical, philosophical speculation. It is interactive and it teases and activates our brain and makes us think as to what is the question. So the Vada Katha, so what is the Vishaya there? Vishaya is the subject for discussion. Is Brahma Jignyasa. Brahma Jignyasa means inquiry into Brahman. So, before you inquire into the Brahman, what is the doubt? The doubt is to do or not to do. Should I do inquiry into the Brahman or should I not do inquiry into the Brahman is the question that we should get. Okay? This is the question that most people ask us outside our, uh, our satsang that we have. People who are materialists just ask us, why bother? Inquiry into the Brahman is not necessary because this chap does not exist. Brahman does not exist. There is no proof for the existence of God or Brahman. That is the first doubt. And this is the doubt that all of us have had 
individually in our lives as we make our passage through life either we have had that or others have had that and asked us so that is the first doubt the second doubt is the second possibility that you may not want to do an inquiry into brahman is when you yourself think that you are brahman okay if i am brahman why should i make an inquiry and know about brahman okay so those are the only two possible scenarios where a doubt may arise where you don't want to do brahma jignas i hope i'm i'm making sense here so one is god does not exist or i am god so if you have these two possibilities then you don't have to do an inquiry into brahman okay now brahman does not exist because there is no no proof for his existence is dealt with badarayana in this sutra but also in shastra yonitvadi karana that he can be known through the shastra so we'll come to that next but it's also addressed gives a hint in this sutra the purva paksha here would be if i am brahman myself that is called brahma atma aikya so if we believe that we are brahman itself then jiva equals brahma then i already know i exist how do i know that because i experience that i exist so if i is jiva equals brahman then it is already known so brahman enquiry is not relevant as it is already known and it is a waste of time okay so this is the purva paksha this is the argument i am brahman already so i don't need to know brahman okay. now where i am getting at is in shastra vichara there is a concept called anubandha chatushtaya so it is adhikari vishaya prayojana sambandha so we have discussed this before i e adhikari means just eligible student vishaya is a subject matter prayojana is a result and sambandha is a relationship between them if i have to go to if i have to do uh, medical school i have to get good uh, a levels then subject matter i have to go to medical school and study and if i study for 5 years i get a degree that's a prayojana and what is the sambandha for all this to apply i have to put an application form then i have to go and uh, stay in a university campus i have to go for my lectures and so on so these mm-hmm. this sambandha links all this and you get a benefit from it so this is called anubandha chatushtaya adhikari vishaya prayojana sambandha now if brahman does not exist then there is no vishaya for discussion at all so it's the anubandha chatushtaya is gone if i am brahman then again you have the same issues of lack of adhikari vishaya prayojana because there is no adhikari there at all if some more by ignorance i forgot and i am brahman that is an entirely different topic for discussion but intrinsically i am brahman i know i am brahman so where is the vishaya there i already know i exist and what is a priyojana i am already brahman Brahm- being brahman is not something you achieve in the future you are already brahman okay so if you take those kind of arguments then brahma jignasa does not make sense so my idea here is to give you how the stream of arguments is in brahma sutras you can do your individual studies and try and uh, come up with a conclusion so moving on to the next slide so when you take brahmatma aikya concept in this purva paksha there are a lot of issues that come about is this brahmatma aikya different from brahman or is it non different from brahman if it is non different it is real or unreal if it is non different then it is already known is brahmatma aikya a quality of brahman that is impossible because brahman is nirguna is brahmatma aikya intrinsic to brahman then if so how can ignorance which is external invade into it brahman is partless how can ignorance penetrate into brahman is ignorance real or unreal for a nirguna brahma what is being covered so these are all the questions so these are all the philosophical problems that comes with brahmatma aikya and badarayana is actually hinting in this purva paksha with all this so worth thinking about so i have listed that what is ignorance what is its origin who has ignorance how can ignorance cover the all knowing yeah so this guy is uh, mundaka says he is uh, yes sarvagnah sarvavid he knows everything he is omniscient how can an omniscient being be covered by ignorance so this is a philosophical questions and brahma sutra actually uh, uh, talks about these things yeah so now uh, to answer this question okay to answer how do you tackle this formidable question that god does not exist or that i am god how do you answer this question to answer this for formidable question badarayana says 
Om Atato Brahma Jignasa Om. And he splits in, and you can split this particular sutra and Om Ata Ataha Brahma Jignasa Om. Okay. I got five minutes, I think, to go through this. If we run out of time, we can deal with it in the next class. So, Atha. So, if you look at this sutra, now we are going into Siddhanta. We are now going into the philosophy of the sutra. Abhijit, next slide. So, what I am showing you here is the essence of it. Uh, next slide, Abhijit. So, um, yes, thank you. So, um, so now, as you know, to remind you, it's called Atato Brahma Jignasa. Okay. So, we said Om Ata Ataha Brahma Jignasa. It's got five components. Now, the first to do is Atataha. Atataha is an important uh, word. So, then you go into the philosophy. That is the beauty of Brahma Sutra. Then you can go deep, dwell deep into it. So, now the question is, Acharya would say, Atashakto Mangalarto Adhikara Anantarya Artascha. So this is Bhashya, commentary as to how you need to interpret this. So, it's the sacred, all sacred texts, for example, the big sacred texts will always start with Om Atataha. So, if you look at Karma Bhimamsa, it will say, Om Atato Jaimini Mimamsa O. If you go to Devi Mimamsa, you say Om Atato Dharma Mimamsa. If you go to Brahma Mimamsa, Om Atato Brahma Jignasa. So they all start as Om Atataha. Why? Because these three words are highly auspicious. First reason Om, we all know, is the first word that comes through creation. But actually, Ata is the second word that comes, and Ataha is the third word that comes in creation. If you did not know this information, here is some new information for you. Om Atataha is what Brahman himself says when he does the creation. Okay. Then Ataha, you split into A and Taha. A means we all know A iti Brahma. In Gita, Aksharanam Akarosmi. Taha means he who gives. Taha is somebody who gives. What does he give? He gives moksha. So Ata becomes very auspicious. Then Atataha can also be split as A and Tatau. We know A iti Brahma. Tatau is pranavachakaha, as Mahaitre Upanishad also itself clarifies. So it is telling you about you, you bow, you give your obeisance to the Supreme Being and also the Mukya Prana who is pervaded along with the Supreme Being all over the universe. So these are all the subtleties that come out from individual words. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so now he says, Atha, the second part is, Atashabdo Mangalartho. So I have told you why it is Mangalartha, but it talks about something called Adhikara Anantarya Artascha. Okay, we got two minutes to do this. Let's see if we can do it. So, what is Adhikara? Adhikara means eligibility for Brahman inquiry. Okay. Tom, Dick, and Harry are not eligible for Brahman inquiry. I am sorry to say that, but I am not prepared to discuss whether Brahman exists or not to a man on the streets. I am not prepared to talk about Brahman to a drunkard on the street. These are all confidential knowledges that we need to discuss. So, you need to have eligibility. You need to be of a person who is worthy of making that inquiry yourself. So, if a drunkard asks me, God does not exist, don't waste his time, I am not going to waste my time talking to him at all because he is not worthy of my time to have that discussion. So Jayatirtha says, who is that eligible person then? He says, Ihahi vivida samsarika dukkha darshanena viraktasya samadamadi mataho mumukshoho adhikarinaha. Very clear. So he is that person who is eligible, who has actually gone through samsara, who has gone through life, who has understood the sufferings in the samsara, who has understood that everything is transient in this world and he wants a solution to his problem that he wants some kind of permanence in his life. That person who reaches that stage in his life, when he looks back and asks that question, that person is a mumukshu or an adhikari. That person is worthy to make this inquiry. Sankaracharya in his Brahma Sutra Bhasha says, Nitya Anitya Vastu Viveka. He gives four criteria. First one, Nitya Anitya Vastu Viveka. Having that understanding of what is eternal, what is non-eternal, and so on. So any person who has this, this kind of approach to life is a worthy student. Yeah. And Gita, chapter 13, 8 to 12, we've discussed this so many times. 20 criteria Krishna has given. Amanitvam, Adambitvam, Ahimsa, Shantihi, 
ஆர்ஜவம் ஆச்சாரிய உபாசனம் ஸ்தைரியம் ஆத்ம விநிகிரக இந்திரிய அர்த்தேஷு வைராகியம் அன அகங்கார எக்ஸெட்ரா ஓகே சோ இஃப் அ பர்சன் ஹேஸ் திஸ் ஆர் இஃப் வி ஆர் சஃபிஷியன்ட்லி குவாலிஃபைட் அண்ட் வி ஹவ் ரீச் ரீச் த ஸ்டேஜ் இன் ஆர் லைஃப் வேர் வி கேன் ஆக்சுவலி ஃபீல் தட் வி ஹேவ் திஸ் தட் பர்சன் இஸ் அ முமுக்ஷு ஓகே அண்ட் there is also a second criteria for a mumukshu is devas and rishis and manishyotamas are also mumukshus devas brahma deva for example shastra tells chaturmukha brahma in a satya loka all that he is doing is he is reciting the vedas and he is teaching brahma sutras and vedas to all those souls who have joined satya loka waiting to go into moksha so the devas are doing this all the time all the greatest rishis are eligible people who are doing this manishyotamas all of us here who are doing satsang every sunday who are asking these questions we are all adhikaris we have all become qualified students to ask this question okay so now moving on to the next slide i am going to continue the plot the very first sutra of ataha brahma jignasa okay so i have told you there are two reasons why brahma jignasa is not worthy of our attention a because god does not exist or i am god but the sutras then answers it says atato brahma jignasa and the first word ata is giving you adhikara anantarya arthashta it is telling who is an eligible person to whom you should even start this kind of conversation and who is the eligible person who will ask this question and find the answers himself if we are not in that what jayatirtha had said vivida samsarika dukkha darshanena we if we have not reached that spot and if we still think this material world is is all pleasurable we are not eligible to make this enquiry we need to reach that point in our life that we feel everything is temporary this is all suffering and i want an answer to this problem so that is a qualified student now the sutra then goes on to say ataha brahma jignasa so next week we will deal with what that word ataha ataha in literally means therefore okay so what does therefore actually mean what is in badarayana's head when he says ataha therefore who is this brahman what is his nature what is him in the vedas jignasa why do we need to know jignasa why bother so those are three key questions that we will deal with next week okay so we'll stop there and i'll say krishna pranamastu and we'll have some brief uh, question and answer discussion i'm really proud i finished on time thank you suras oh thank you thank you yeah do you want you want to chant first or you take the questions first so we have question we are done okay any questions mother it's really again uh, uh, you know it's starting off to be very very high high quality lecture again and uh, uh, everybody is very excited uh, i'm sure you'll all share the same feeling uh, anybody got questions please uh, sudarshan one query is the time enough for madhu ji because i felt he was uh, you know just yeah i think to... he is uh, it's not about it because um, you know because we, we you know any lecture usually you know people can listen only 40 minutes to one hour there's no point in going on and that's why we you know we will do it in sort of intervals that makes it more easier people can take it in as well because usually it goes we are going up to 5 o'clock till 6:45 and all which is fine nobody complained but we thought like it's um, it's much better we sort of do it in shorter intervals so that people can take it in as well yeah and we have a bit of time for question and answer and everything Yeah, that's fine so i think jai shila uh, shila ji just uh, there is no rush to finish brahma sutra because there is so much information that is packed into each yeah. sutra and each word and yeah. uh, let's let's see how it goes time is at our disposal god willing so we'll do it we'll okay. do it thank you thank, thank you, you. <laughs> uh, namaste can i just clarify a little doubt this is yeah, yeah sure yeah. introduce yeah. yourself please just, uh, so where you indicated the introduce yourself sorry um My name is Savita. I'm an ophthalmologist practicing in Liverpool. We live in Chester. Hi, hi, Savita. First time we've joined you actually, and uh, it's really excellent. I don't know where you've mastered all this from, in spite of your professional career. Um, yeah, is that the question? No, no. <laughs> the question was, uh, 
you know, you showed us the five um, concepts through which, um, based on Kolb's learning cycle. So one was Vishaya, the subject matter to discuss. The second one you said was doubt. Uh, what yeah. was labeled as Vishaya Vishay. as well, I thought on the slide, is that? So if you look at the Sanskrit letter, Sh and Sa. Yeah. So Vishaya is the subject yeah. matter. Vishaya is the doubt. So there was a slight change in Sanskrit okay. alphabets there. So yeah. 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 Okay, the so, second one. Yeah, and I was also just wondering if this philosophy is based entirely on uh, the Vedanta philosophy and is that why it's called Vedanta Sutra? Is it? Yeah. So no, 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 I, 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 I clarify, it's the, other way, it's the other way around. Hmm. Vedanta is called Vedanta philosophy because it's Vedanta Sutra. It is the exposition of Vedanta Sutra. That is why it's called Vedanta philosophy. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thanks, Savita. Welcome to our group. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Sudarshan. And this is Madhusudan, my husband. Okay. His name, Hello. Savita, husband is also Madhusudan. He's an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank okay. You. Are you the one? Are you the guy who played the Veena yesterday? Yes, yes. Oh, you you really played very well, sir. I saw you excellent performance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you watch the program fully then? Yeah, 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 I did, I did actually for the one and a half hours because Sumana is our close friend. Sumana in Nottingham. So I'm based in Nottingham. So Sumana was organizing. In fact, last uh, week we were uh, at a house uh, at one of my friends, Shushrut, who is also part of the group. So we yeah. were at Shushrut Kulkarni's house and all the rehearsals were going on. Yeah. Yeah, it was me. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions? Um, Madhu, it's, it's Nandish here. So just a, a query and probably a bit of a stretch. You know, in regards to the first, you know, Jigyasas Adhikarnam, maybe we talk about Brahma, Atma, Ikya. Is that again, sort of in a way, leading towards Advaita philosophy? Yeah, well, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question that you asked. So the discussion there is, what is the Purva Paksha? Purva Paksha means what is the, uh, what is the, uh, you know, the opponent's view. So the way the philosophical discussion happen is you take what the op opposition's view is and then you counteract it. So now there is a bigger question as to what is the philosophy of the Vedanta Sutra or, uh, or Brahma Sutra? Is it theistic or is it monistic? Yeah, so you are asking that question whether Brahma Sutra is monistic. Monistic means is the philosophy of the Brahma Sutra. Monistic means does it concur with the Advaita philosophy or is the philosophy of Brahma Sutra theistic and it concurs with the philosophy of Visishta Advaita, Advaita and other strands of Visishta Advaita stroke Dvaita. Okay, so that is much more of a, 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 an issue for debate. And believe me, for since the advent of Sankaracharya, appearance of Sankaracharya in the 6th, 7th century, this has been an ongoing debate for 1400 years as to whether it is theistic or monistic. Yeah. So you and me, we are not going to be able to decide that. So I think the idea here is that I insert the thought as to how these discussions transpire. And each one of us make our individual studies and see what the approach is. So ideally what you should have is, so when I do my sutra studies, I have Sri Bhashya of Ramanuja. I have Shankara Bhashya and I have uh, uh, Madhvacharya's Bhashya and we have four works. And you keep everything and then you read and you study and digest and see this, this fit in, that fit in. And you make those kind of critical um, uh, analysis and then come up with solutions. So whether it is theistic or monistic, the court is divided right at the middle. For those who are proponents of the theistic view would strongly view that the philosophy of Badarayana is theistic. Look at this guy. He has uh, written Gita. Gita is theistic. It's a conversation between Krishna and uh, Arjuna. Krishna is the supreme soul. Arjuna is the soul. There are two different beings here having a conversation. It cannot be an imaginary conversation. And uh, similarly, if you look at all the Puranas, they are dealing with all these demigods and jivas and, and the supreme being and so on. All these are imaginary. So you could have you could have these kind of lively debates as to whether it is theistic or monistic. 
Okay, I would leave it for all of us to make the judgment call. But it is just that this is a very fertile ground to make those kind of evaluations. You're right. I have taken a view, a particular view when I gave a Purva Paksha, but the intention there was how do the how do the philosophical debate progress? So we don't we may even forget the second option. We may even take Brahman does not exist. So if Brahman does not exist, then how do you then deal with it? Then you will say Atato Brahma Jignasa. Ata, eligibility. If you are a drunkard on the street, I am not going to waste my time talking to you about Brahman exists or not. Okay, you need to have some eligibility even before I can have a conversation. Then I can go to the next word, ataha, and then tell you, therefore, what does a therefore mean and expand and explain? Yeah, so we'll deal with that next week. Thank you, Nadesh. Tough question. Uh, Madhu Suresh here. Hi, Suresh. Uh, yeah, just a, a, a question is, the three great Acharyas have come up with three different interpretations. Now, is it because they... Uh, interpreted Brahma Sutra itself differently and applied it differently? Or is it because they uh, came up with different interpretations of the, the way the, the, what's written in the Vedas or the Upanishads? Uh, where, I mean, where, what's the base? I mean, where did they deviate? And, and uh, uh, why is that difference of uh, opinion coming in? Yeah, so that's again the root of the, I wouldn't say problem, the root of the systems that we have at this point. So there are two ways of looking at scriptures, uh, Suresh. You can look at the scriptures at their face value as it is, and then, then you can uh, try and understand it. Or you can come up with a preconceived idea and notion, and you read with your preconceived uh, ideas to see whether what you think is actually, you can find those evidences in the, in the literature. So there are two approaches to this. Number one. Number two, now there is, uh, le let me also remind you, and uh, as, we dis uh, as we did these discussions before, yeah, data yata purvam akalpayati. So we have discussed, when we discuss the creation, so this creation of the universe is not a one time creation. This is a creation that has happened in eternal cycles. So are we now made to believe that in this cycle, we have had Shankaracharya, Ramanujacharya and Madhvacharya. So in the next cycle of creation, will we still have somebody with the Shankaracharya, Ramanujacharya and Madhvacharya? Or in the previous infinite cycles of creation that, that has happened, that we have not had Shankaracharya, Ramanujacharya, Madhvacharya and, and all other Acharyas, Nimbarka Acharya, Baladeva and so on. Yeah. So if you take the grand scheme of things, so there is a, there is a particular view uh, called um, Anadikalato Vrittaha Samayabi Pravahataha. So what that means is the philosophies of the world, the philosophies, the various types of philosophies of the world that exist have not been created by one person in this particular creation. Yeah. These philosophies have eternally existed throughout the cycles of creations eternally. It is just that they satisfy those types of souls that find that type of philosophy suitable for their spiritual progression. So each one of us are unique. That I think we have to accept. We are unique individuals. Something we like and something we don't like based on our own intrinsic nature. So what these philosophies are doing is they're actually catering and satisfying the needs of particular types of souls and that is the way of looking at it, looking at it rather than having internal strife as to mine is bigger yours is bigger mine is more informed yours is more informed the core principle there is data yata purvam akalpayati jivas are infinite jivas are uncreated and in every creation a bunch of jivas are thrown into existence and based on their own intrinsic natures they find their salvation and their destination so each strand of philosophy will help these jivas to make that destination. So that is how I view it and why Shankaracharya took the Advaita position, why Ramanujacharya took the Vishishta Advaita position and why Madhvacharya took the Dvaita position is only known to them. They were all been here uh, 1400 years ago and uh, 11th century Ramanujacharya and uh, 12th century Madhvacharya. So we can't ask them that question. But if the philosophy appeals to you, go ahead and practice that. Yeah, I think, yeah, Madhu, that's... Thanks, thanks, Madhu. Yeah, 
मधु जी जस्ट वन दिस थिंग दैट आई हर्ड दैट शंकराचार्य इन द एंड टेन इयर्स ऑफ हिज लाइफ ही वुड ही टॉट ओनली भक्ति बिकॉज़ आई रेड इट इन द आचार्य बुक आई हैव रेड इट विद माय डॉटर हैज गॉट दैट बुक अबाउट आचार्यस एंड यू नो gurus yeah. so guru purnima time i was reading that and i it was really surprising because first 20 years he lived only 32 years out of that first 20 or 22 years he taught only advaita and he had the debates and all but after that 10 years he opened all the temples and you know 10 years he you know spent his life in uh, bhakti yoga yeah so uh, uh, shila ji i think you're right because uh, most of us are uh, upset that, uh, that one of the one of the one of the great vaishnavites who were there uh, at that point of time was sankaracharya himself and in many uh, places he would actually uh, he would say narayana and so on he would say uh, narayana ha ishana shila ha and, and wherever there is a, a quotation he does the bhajagovindam we all know the famous bhajagovindam that he has composed so i'm i'm pretty uh, most of us yes think that bhakti was right in the middle but the philosophy and the bhakti somehow they are not fitting each other if your bhakti am i devotion am, am i practicing devotional service to myself a devotional practice happens only there is somebody who is lower and somebody who is higher and the high, lower one looks up to the higher one and has a loving relationship to the higher one so one until you have that concept there is uh, there isn't a devotional service assets that can happen so i think the the his, and most of you as you know know the historical significance and contributions of sankaracharya was a land that was plagued by buddhist nihilistic philosophy sabbahau had to be turned around and brought into the vedic tradition so this is this big ship that has to steer and make a u turn and you can't immediately turn this and you have to somehow bring people back into your fold into your court using the same strands of nihilistic philosophy but draw them into the vedantic stream and that is the greatest contribution of sankaracharya that uh, all of us know about thank you thank you sudarshan you had something no no i i mean i was just saying yeah, the previous question you were saying about uh, you know different approaches to salvation and uh, it's about you cannot you don't know why sankaracharya did interpret it like that uh, ramanuja acharya interpreted it like that i think that sort of an approach is there throughout india and maybe hinduism that's why you know that reflects on our way of life and how we approach the various uh, people various other religions and that is very inherent and that doesn't come overnight that sort of quality and that means uh, you know we have we have all assimilated those sort of principles into our life over centuries and centuries that's what i want to say all of us even even common man yeah so i think it's uh, we we all have to agree to disagree on certain things but that that should be at a at a foundation of tolerance and respect so everybody has tolerance and respect and view other views as views and take it at that uh, uh, face value rather than having animosities and fighting and killing each other you are absolutely right our civilization has always been known for that maybe you could say we are a victim of that but that is what we are one more query madhu ji um yeah. i have heard somewhere that uh, bhagavatam is bhashya for brahma sutras with badarayana wrote himself and i have even heard yeah. why the other acharyas had to do it i mean this is kripalu ji mentions keeps mentioning it but uh, is it right that brahma sutra yeah, yeah. uh, so uh, all all schools all schools of philosophies believe you will know that as a fact that yes bhagavata purana has, has been composed by veda vyasa and it is an exposition of the uh, the brahma sutra so the traditional teaching in at least from my guru is unless you know the brahma sutras properly you cannot understand the bhagavata purana you can either read bhagavata purana as just a story and this various plots mm-hmm. and various personalities and so on if you want to get the intricacies and the inner philosophies of bhagavad gita of bhagavata purana you need to have insight into the brahma sutra because the, a particular sutra in brahma sutra will have an explanation or a story or some kind of practical example in uh, in uh, bhagavata purana so you cannot look at bhagavata purana in isolation you have to take the sutras and bhagavata purana to come up with the, what is the right purport and what is the right philosophical meaning of that particular aspect in for example bhagavata purana say in we when we dealt with creation 
we took Bhagavata Purana as a classic example and you looked at nine stages of creation. But to explain that nine stages of creation in Bhagavata Purana, we had to actually go into Janmadhyaya Seyataha from Sutra 1 and Sutra 2 and we had to go into you know, Purusha Shukta and we had to go into various Upanishads to understand it. So it goes both ways. It's both horizontal and vertical that we need to do. But somehow uh, certain certain organization seems to take that at the uh, in isolation, but not by taking other aspects into it. Our acharyas are very clear. You have to use these manuals to understand what is the philosophy in Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavata Purana. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But any any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, we will uh, sort of give a hand to Madhu and then we'll meet next week. Yeah, give a big hand, please. Thank you. 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 Thank